it, it, um, but the other thing that we, we, we realized there was that we could have gotten a higher percentage. And, and then w when we designed the, uh, the Mill Creek House, Conrad Nobert wa had done some reading that I should have done years ago uh, in the CMHC uh, Tap the Sun pamphlet. Uh, it's, it's available by a mail order from them. Uh, and it has some good passive solar design rules of thumb. And he had memorized it. And uh, um, I, I was armed with the experience of Riverdale, and, you know, keen to try, try more. He wanted to add concrete floors. And I, you know, we were, we didn't have a lavish budget, and I had visions of uh, Q-deck and s steel beams and horrible disruptions to the normal construction process, and just I just told him he couldn't afford it. But he was very persistent, and uh, he, he talked to Andy Smith, who, you know, without, without telling me, I just... Uh, <laughs> I thought, and Andy said, no problem, just do it as an overlay. And I was shocked to find that we didn't have to even beef up the structure, other than the beams and the pad loads, to handle this two and a half inches of, of, uh, of concrete, which is, which is uh, a huge total amount of weight. weight. We had to do bigger pads, but the joists were the same. And, and on, the, on the Belgravia house, the spans were a little longer, the same size joists, and we still didn't have to beef them up. And now we're doing the Parkland House. We've got 18-foot spans with eye joists, and the, this extra 30-pound dead load does not change the joist size. It, it just stiffens it up. I, it's, it's uh, you know, sometimes you, you win some, <laughs> and, and, and that really was a, was a case of that. So, um, in, in the, uh, so our, our <clears throat> and, and the, the, uh, the Parkland House was very interesting too because we, it was given to fourth year mechanical engineering students as a, as a sort of de design assignment, their fourth year major design project and, and, a, and a team of really bright uh, young engineers tackled this. Uh, the assignment was how do you get this house to net zero with the lowest possible cost and so they modeled it in, in Hot 2000 and uh, I, I, I helped them a bit. I, I reviewed their model of, and uh, didn't notice that they're, um, you know, they, and, and this, when you start to do this, this will be a familiar experience. It's just, damn, you know, it's just too much energy still. And we know we've done all this stuff. We got our 60 walls and our 100 in the attic and it's tight. What the heck's going on? And, uh, and I noticed we were still heating in June and we had all these windows. And it was because we had no mess in the house. As soon as we added some mass, we, we dropped about 2,000 kilowatt hours a year because the, the solar gain we're talking about is usable solar gain. So that, that energy is always going to come through those windows, but hot 2,000 stops counting it when you're getting too hot. It, and if, and if it, it only talks about the, the energy that's useful to, to raise the temperature up to room temperature. So, if, if you can take the excess during the day, store it, and then re-radiate it during, during the night, you can get a lot further with, with the, essentially with, the, with that same solar radiation. Otherwise, you're going to be opening windows and dumping it. Um, so and I just, this is just, uh, you know, this isn't something I expect everybody to do, but meeting with Conrad together, we came up with this idea that we could make our awning do double duty. And uh, so we came up with the idea of putting the uh, solar panels on the awning, and it gives us a double payback because in the, in the summer when we're shading the uh, unwanted solar gain, we're actually turning it into electricity and uh, getting, uh, and then in the winter we can move it out of the way, get 100% of the solar gain, and, and by angling the, the, pan, the uh, modules, they're, in the summer they're aiming at the high summer sun, in the winter they're aiming at the low winter sun, and in the, in the process we're getting about 16% more output from the same area of, of module. And uh, we're still working on this, we're hoping, uh, we're, some steel got ordered, and we're, we're, uh, we're going to try and pull out all the stops and have this ready for the EcoSolar Home Tour on, on uh, at least on the Mill Creek House. So just to, to look at, at these numbers again, the, the um, gross space heating on these buildings is, is in around, uh, you know, the 10 to 20,000 kilowatt hour a year range and, uh, you know, our, our biggest single source of heat uh, on, the, uh, on the Mill Creek and Belgravia houses 
is is our passive solar. Uh, the, the, the south glazing fraction, that's a, the, the area of glass in relation to the area of the house is up into an area that's that's, a, that's just a bit scary. And, and if you compare this with the Bonnie Dune house, which is on a lot that doesn't have good solar access, uh, it's only an R40 house, it's a, it's, but it's it's still a 17,000 kilowatt hours a year for, for heating is not bad, but their usable solar gains are, are uh, way less than half of ours in the in the two net zero projects, and uh, it, it would make it very hard to to, to ever get there. Uh, in in designing for passive solar gain, you want to select uh, different types of windows for different exposures. It's it's important to have glass that will maximize the solar gain on the south. The solar heat gain coefficient of our, our south-facing glass is 0.57, and the U value is around 0.78. U value is the inverse of, of uh, our value. Um, on the east and west windows, we're using windows with a higher insulation value and a much lower solar heat gain coefficient, and we're, we're happy with that because, generally speaking, most direct sunlight coming in from the east and west is in the summer and, uh, and is more likely to overheat you, so really important to select windows that um, that have the, as high a possible solar heat gain coefficient um, and you know the and a reasonably high r value on the on the south and then uh, best r value you can get and and um, accept the the low solar heat gain coefficient on the east and west I mean, windows are still the the weak link in the building you know you see numbers there we're getting over 50 percent of our heat if you add up all the windows in the house in aggregate they're they're responsible for about 40 percent of the total heat loss so they're there but this is not something we really feel we can do anything about we, we've you know we're just egging the window companies on and hoping for better windows. It'll, it'll make a big difference when it happens. And, and uh, just a summary of slight changes as, uh, as we've gone through the process, we, we uh, anyway, just better move along here, so. But after after uh, maximizing passive solar, then, then it's worthwhile to go through the um, Hot water loads, they, you'll see in a minute, they're, they get to be a pretty big chunk of the, of the uh, total amount of energy. Um, and, and that's fairly easy. Uh, low flow shower heads, faucet aerators, efficient appliances. Uh, and, and apply the same kind of methodology. I mean, look at that appliance and say, well, that appliance is 200 bucks more than the uh, equivalent gas or electricity guzzler, but uh, it's saving, um, uh, this many kilowatt hours a year, and uh, you know how does how does that stack up? It's typically uh, efficient appliances are a very good investment uh, in in, in uh, almost any measure. 